In this session, we're going to explore progression in the teaching of early reading through systematic synthetic phonics. To do that, I will be referring to programs that are used in schools, but at the moment we are in a transition period as there is a new set of validations for phonics schemes in schools, which is, say, the ones that are recognised by the Department for Education. At the time of uh, editing this in August 21, this is complete, but there will be a new set of uh, validations coming out in March 2022, so you need to be aware of that. We need to remember that in the simple view of reading, reading is considered as a combination of language comprehension and word recognition, and it is only through a combination of those that a child can become a comprehending reader. So that when we are talking about a child recognising words, that is to, to say they are able to say the words in front of them on, in, in a text, we cannot say that they are reading. We, are simp we can simply say that they are able to recognise the words. Reading itself, the act of being a reader, requires comprehension as well. However, in this session we are looking specifically at language, at uh, word recognition. In 2010, the government, through the Department for Education, carried out a revision of phonics schemes and validated those that met their core criteria. The list was revised in 2017. If you have been in a school or going to a school uh, before the newly validated schemes from 21-22 have been embedded, you may well see any of these schemes or combinations of them. Um, so a lot of these will be familiar to you. Letters and Sounds you will see is in brackets because Letters and Sounds was a Department for Education publication rather than being a commercial scheme that was being validated by the Department for Education. So here you will see things like Jolly Phonics and you will see Read Write Inc. Those were validated under the DfE core criteria and some of them will be revalidated. So you will see them continuing. Read Write Inc. has already been revalidated under the 21-22 process, but Jolly Phonics at the time of creating this revised session had not been. So Jolly Phonics had only got the validation from 2010. Presumably Jolly Phonics are going for one in the next round in March 2022. We will be using letters and sounds. Letters and sounds will probably start to disappear from schools as a, a program on its own because it doesn't have the resources to work alongside it that other commercially published programs have. However, you will see programs with the words letters and sounds in the titles and they, as they start to appear, and those will be based on the existing letters and sounds, but will have new resources. So they'll maintain the structure of letters and sounds. Letters and sounds remains a uh, sound program, or and the government is perfectly happy for schools to work with it as long as they follow the rules for phonics programs and they can create their own phonics programs from letters and sounds. The advantage for us in university is that it is freely available and it provides a reference point that we can all refer to and know what we're talking about. We'll come on to the phases of letters and sounds later. As I've already said, the validation process is ongoing. If you want to find out about different programs that you may have seen in school or that you will see, there is a document, Validated Phonics Programs and Schemes, which provides links and summaries of the different programs as they are being validated. So at the time of this August 21 revision of this session, you will see the currently validated programs. So we have there the 2010 validated programs and then those that have been validated or revalidated for 2021-22. So at the top there, you will see that uh, Essential Letters and Sounds has been validated in 21-22. So that was a, a, a month ago or so. And it has indeed the title Letters and Sounds in it. So it's based on that original program of Letters and Sounds. If you look at the bottom, you've got Tap Tap Bat System of a 2010 validation. Uh, there is no indication that that is going to be revalidated at the moment. Of course, things may change between now and March 2022. But look at the list here and how many different programs or schemes there are, and you will see how impossible it is for us to cover all of those. What we are doing in this session is looking at the principles of progression in systematic synthetic phonics. 
when you are in school, you will need to look at the particulars of the scheme or programme that your school has either bought into or has created themselves and to spot those differences and just make sure you follow the instructions that you are given by the school and then you will have no problem in mapping children's progression, teaching for progression and assessing children uh, to see how far they are progressing. On the next two slides, I have provided the core criteria for the 21-22 validation process for the Department for Education. So any schemes that you see in school in the future, um, when they have adapted to the revalidation process, should fulfill these criteria. I am not going to read them. I suggest if you wish to read them all, by all means, pause the uh, PowerPoint or the video and read them for yourselves. I'm going to pick out, pick out a couple of important points. And here is the second page. As I say, you are by all means, have a look, have a uh, uh, pause the session and have a read of what the Department for Education is expecting. Every programme that you are using in schools in the near future, and certainly when you become teachers, should fulfil these core criteria. The three that I have picked out of relevance to this session in particular around progression are that any program in school for systematic synthetic phonics should be designed for daily teaching sessions and teach the main grapheme phoneme correspondences of English in a clearly defined incremental sequence. So we can see the principle of progression built in there. It should begin by introducing a defined group of grapheme phoneme correspondences that enable children to read and spell many words early on. So it's getting in fast so that children are able to start reading for themselves early on in the process of systematic synthetic phonics teaching. And children should progress from simple to more complex phonic knowledge and skills, cumulatively covering all the major grapheme phoneme correspondences in English. So you can see how these three core criteria are specifically around children's progression in early reading. In addition to the DFE's validation criteria, I've also pulled out some common characteristics here. And you're welcome again to either pause the PowerPoint or the video. But I have highlighted in red those that are particularly significant for us in this session. First of all, within the scheme or program, there is internal coherence between all materials with grapheme phoneme correspondences learnt in order of complexity from a simple alphabetic code to a complex code. So the teaching and learning materials, including decodable texts, should follow the same progressive order from the simple to the complex. And if we look at the final point here, children's development in systematic synthetic phonics is assessed and tracked through clear and consistent criteria and processes. While the 2010 validation process core criteria were much simpler than those for the 21-22 validation process, they still align with it and are still relevant to uh, understanding how phonics programs work. So we're going to use those and unpick those through looking at academic writing on phonics. Initially, children learn grapheme phoneme correspondences in a clearly defined incremental sequence, and we imply the important skills of blending phonemes in order all through a word to read it. So we read from left to right, blending the phonemes k at cat in order to read the word cat. To apply that we are learned to apply the skills of segmenting words into their constituent phonemes to spell. So we want to spell the word cat, we uh, segment it orally to k at, and we apply the graphic, the relevant graphemes to those phonemes. And we understand that blending and segmenting are reversible processes. So let's unpick those points in a little more detail through the work of Jolliffe and War. Jolliffe and War have uh, taken the state. Erie's model of reading development is uh, very influential in helping people understand how children's reading development, how children's reading develops. 
and if we see it starts here with a pre-alphabetic phase where ch children read by looking at visual cues so the example given here is they might read a word as Pepsi despite the fact it has a letter X at the front because visually it's within Pepsi's own distinctive logo so the child recognizes that and they have a word associated with that visual image even though they don't know what the letters mean in terms of uh, having sounds that correspond to those letters. When we're teaching phonics we are thinking about these partial alphabetic phases and full alphabetic phases in particular and moving from one to the other. So through phonics we enable children to develop their letter sound information and as children are reading, if, if you look at the examples here, reading tin as toy, reading jail as jewel, you can see that they are a child would be drawing partially on their letter sound information. They're drawing on that, but they haven't got all the necessary components in order to read um, word recognize accurately. Whereas when they have the full alphabetic phase, which we're taking them towards through the process of systematic synthetic phonics, they're able to uh, um, say aloud an unfamiliar word, so the word dog, they can convert that into sounds, d -og, dog. So there is a sequential process here, the child moving from a pre-alphabetic phase where they're just seeing images to a partial alphabetic phase where they realize that letters have sounds associated but they're not secure on con connecting one to the other and then a full alphabetic phase. There is this final stage, the consolidated alph alphabetic phase, where the child recognizes large elements such as morphemes. Now, morphemes, remember, are the smallest unit of meaning in a language. So if you look at the example here, we have dance and danced. And dance is one unit of meaning, and the ED is another unit of meaning because it tells us that they danced and when these are joined together, it changes the nature of the word. So dance is modified by adding an ED on the end. Some people don't see this as part of phonics, but it clearly fits within phonics programs. And it is a necessary part of children's reading development. As I said, we're going to use letters and sounds. Now, if you're using a different phonics program in a school, the order in which uh, sounds are presented may be slightly different. The way things are done may be slightly different. But hopefully by following the letters and uh, analyzing the letters and sounds progression here, you will see a way that you can approach understanding how children progress through a phonics program with which you're working. There shouldn't be huge differences, but there may be small shifts. Letters and sounds is organized into six phases. And what I've tried to do in this presentation is to stick to the color coordination that's used in the publication itself. So through all the slides, you will see the colors that, that match those in the book. And of course, if you wish, you can download the Letters and Sounds book from um, the internet and have that alongside to read alongside this presentation. So we move from phase one to phase two, three, four, five, six, obviously, but phase one and phase six uh, sort of stand alone because they are a bit different from the others. The main space within which we see progression is within phase two, three, four, five. Phase six, is we start, start looking at the morphology, which is that last point that was made, and phase one, well, we will explain phase one in a moment. If you look at the notes and guidance for practitioners and teachers uh, for letters and sounds, so that's also available as a download, you will see in the back on page 28 there is this table. And this PowerPoint uses this table as a basis for this explanation, but um, I have uh, augmented what is there, uh, drawing in much more detail on what's through the programme. In this presentation, we're going to cover progression in these areas, phonological and phonemic awareness, oral segmenting and blending, and then knowledge of grapheme phoneme correspondences. Remember that acronym GPCs, it's very important. Then blending and segmenting from written text, which is 
a development from oral segmenting and blending. Then we're going to look at high frequency words. We're going to look at high frequency words containing regular GPCs and also those which are common exception words. And we'll explain what high frequency words are at that point. And then we'll look at morphology at the end. So phase one it stands separate really from phase so in the first paragraph, it says phase one phase, uh, paves the way for systematic teaching of phonic work to begin in phase two. Um, but if you look at the final uh, lines there, it says phase one activities are designed to underpin and run alongside activities in other phases. So although you may start with phase one teaching and learning, those activities should run through every other phase um, the development of phonological and phonemic awareness should be part of what you are doing throughout your phonics probe. And it is important to say that some schemes do not have an equivalent of phase one in which phonological and phonemic awareness are taught separately, but those things are taught running alongside the other developmental stages of the phonics program. In letters and sounds and those schemes that are based on letters and sounds, you will find a, an equivalent to phase one. Um, Jolliffe and War define these two terms, phon phonological awareness and phonemic awareness, in these ways. Phonological awareness, the ability to perceive, recall and manipulate sounds, and phonemic awareness, the ability to perceive and manipulate the phonemes in a spoken word and to remember the order of phonemes in words. So the second one is a development of the first. It's far more specific. Some people, when they're talking about phonological awareness, will be talking about the ability to hear those phonemes as well. But the phonemic awareness is the actually being able to recognize and identify them in words. And in letters and sounds, this is done through environmental sounds, instrumental, so playing with musical instruments, body percussion, um, rhythm and rhyme, use of nursery rhyme, alliteration, using voice sounds, making lots of different sounds with the mouth so you're feeling what sounds come from your mouth when you put your tongue and your lips and you may uh, in particular positions, um, and oral blending and segmenting. The development of phonological awareness is not without uh, its critique. The letters and sounds approach is, is based on the assertion that you should be teaching phonological awareness as a discrete area apart from everything else. You should be doing exercises that develop children's phonological awareness. Now whilst there is no one uh, that I have read who will say that's wrong, um, if you look at the second paragraph here from uh, uh, from uh, Johnson and Watson's book Teaching Synthetic Phonics, they say that there is that, that their position is that there is no clear evidence that the teaching of phonological awareness in isolation from printed text has any impact on children's reading development. That's a summary of their uh, statement. It's not actually a direct quote. Um, so that statement above that it should remember that phase one activities are designed to underpin and run alongside activities in other phases does sit very well with that research conclusion that actually doing phonological uh, awareness activities without any reference to print doesn't actually make much difference according to the research. Doing those activities with activities that are related to print does have impact. So going back to the idea of segmenting and blending, uh, oral segmenting and blending is a fundamental part of this stage in the teaching and learning of systematic synthetic phonics. So we say a word, dog. We segment a word orally to identify the phonemes, d, o, g. We sound them out individually, d, o, g. And then we take those phonemes, d, o, g, and we blend them together, d, o, g, d, o, g, dog. We hear or discern the word no reference to printed text at that point when we're doing that oral when we use when we have textual uh, blending and segmenting that's a development from this so that's the first stage that oral segmenting and blending where you move from spoken word to spoken sounds 
to spoken word again. Nursery rhymes are also a vital part of this process. The children are developing their understanding of sound of, of phonemes through playing with rhyme. To know that dog rhymes with log, rhymes with bog, means that a child is beginning to understand how to segment because they know that the d sound is separate from the og, the u is separate from og, the b is separate from og. So playing with nursery rhymes, teaching nursery rhymes is not a luxury, it's a vital part of children hearing language and learning those sounds and also hearing the rhythms of English language as well. So moving on now from phase one to phase two, and we move from phase uh, two, three, four and five, we see a development in how children are, be, be, are, are exposed to the different grapheme phoneme correspondences. The first thing children are going to do is to learn the letters of the alphabet, or at least learn some letters of the alphabet and the sounds that are associated with them. So you'll see in phase two, they learn 19 letters, and phase three, they learn seven letters. For the first six weeks, they are just learning those letters and the, a single sound that is associated with them. So in phase two, it'd be s, a, t, p, i, n, m, d, g, o, k, k, e, a, r, l, h, b, f. In phase three, j, v, w, x, y, z. Not only do children learn those individual letters and the sounds, they also learn common consonant digraphs because they'll need these to be able to read quite simple words. So they'll learn that CK makes K, double F is F, double L is ool, double S is S. When they're in phase three, they'll learn double Z, Q, U, C, H, S, H, T, H, N, G, A, I, double E, I, G, H, O, A, and double O. You're building children's repertoire of grapheme phoneme correspondences and expanding the number of simple words that they can read and that they can write. Because remember, when they read, they are blending these sounds together. When they're writing, they're segmenting words. If you look at phase four, which comes after 18 weeks, the children have been learning these things after 18 weeks, and then they have four to six weeks where they simply consolidate what they have learned. So we are introducing new sounds every week for 18 weeks, new sat grapheme phoneme correspondences, sound letter correspondences for 18 weeks, and then they have four to six weeks where they simply can uh, consolidate that learning and practice it and put it into different contexts. Then in phase five, they are introduced to uh, alternatives, alternative ways of pronouncing. So they might have learned O-W, but now they're going to learn that it can be cow, it can be ow, or it can be blow, o. It can E-A can be eat, E, or it can be bread, e. Eh. They're also going to learn that they are, that you can uh, that you can have other graphemes for the same sound, so you can have other ways of spelling the same sound. So we, they have already learned a i in phase three as a. Now they're going to learn a y, and hopefully this is bringing you back to the four key principles of phonics that. Sounds can be represented by letters. They can be represented by more than one letter. That a single sound can be represented in different ways. And that a single grapheme can be pronounced in different ways. And so children are being introduced into these incrementally. Looking at phase five and that notion that we're taught that there are different graphemes for the same phoneme and that the same um, Grapheme can be pronounced in, in different ways. 
there so that OW can be OW or O. If you look at phase 6, then children are learning how to spell words within particular, how to spell graphemes in particular contexts. So if you look at the example there, C and C, that they're attaching a particular grapheme to a particular meaning. So when I see you on the other side of the road, that I know that that is double E. When I go to play in the C, I know that that is spelled EA. Now phase six goes throughout year two, and in fact should carry on beyond year two. We're now going to think about um, blending and segmenting. So just as a quick revision, we've looked at the idea of oral blending. Now we're thinking about textual. So we're seeing words, we're seeing letters. How are we going to blend? We scan through the word from left to right. As we see the graphemes, we say those sounds in automatic response. So we see the letters C, A, T, and we say the graphemes, so we say the phonemes, the sounds, in response to those graphemes. We see C-A-T and we say K-A-T. And then we blend those together. K-A-T, cat. And we can hear or discern the word. So we are starting with the written word. And from that, we are moving to the spoken word. Remember, blending and segmenting is reversible. So when we're segmenting, we start with the spoken word. So we say the word slowly and segment it to identify the sounds, the phonemes. Cat. Cat. We identify the sounds. K -a -t. And we decide what are the appropriate graphemes for the sounds, which goes back to that knowing the context that we're using for words like C and C. But let's simply work with cat. So the most obvious uh, k sound in English at the beginning of a word is, is, is the most obvious way to spell that is with a C. A is quite often an A, it's most often an A, and T is most often a T, and so we can spell it, and we write that down. So we are starting with the spoken word cat, and we end up with the written word C-A-T. Remember, we use sounds, we use the phonemes, k -at. when we are talking about reading. We use the letters, C-A-T, when we are talking about spelling. To see how there's progression in the skills of blending and segmenting, it helps to look at the examples on this page here. So let's look at phase two. And it says, segment whole words into separate sounds for spelling. So if I say the word in, then we segment it i n we segment up, up, and you can see how the, these words are using the individual letters of the alphabet with the single sounds associated with them. Above it says blend separate sounds together into whole words. So you'd be reversing one from the other. We are reading the word sit, s it, sit, and then we're using that word for writing. We're spelling it, sit. We segment it, s i and write the letters S, I, T. If you look at phase three, we're blending and segmenting those single letters and graphemes of more than one letter. So if you remember, CH was introduced in phase three when we were looking at the introduction of grapheme phoneme correspondences. So now the child has got correspondences for the letter I, the letter P, and the letters CH, so now that child can read the word chip, ch -ip, and they can also write that word chip. We segment it, ch -ip, and we allocate the digraph CH and the grapheme I and the grapheme P. So you can see now how that is more complex than the previous phase. We're also going to look at two-syllable words as well. So words like bedroom, bedroom is two syllables, and we can read that b, e, d, and then r, u, m. And if we're going to spell it, to write it, we'd say bedroom, 
it's two syllables, bedroom. The first syllable is bed, which we can spell by segmenting b e d, which will give us b e d, and then the second syllable is room, and we will have we segment it into sounds. We get r u m, and we know r is a letter r, and that last sound m is a letter m, and we've learnt that digraph double o for u. In phase four, we're looking at adjacent consonants, which is something that a lot of people struggle with. So if you look at the word frog, frog, hearing that there is a difference between um, th th those two consonant sounds, f, r, precede the o, g, the o, g, is quite tricky. And you need to think about what your mouth is doing the shapes it is making, which manipulate the sounds. Remember, consonants is where you block the air, so that f is where your teeth come to your lips, r, your tongue is going to the back of your mouth. There are very clearly two different shapes there, two different sounds. So being able to identify those sounds is very important for not only reading, but also for spelling. So blending and segmenting those adjacent consonants, that's a big, important shift there. In phase five, all of the graphing phonic correspondences that have been learnt so far, uh, children try reading and spelling using them, blending and segmenting. And when they're reading, if they um, see a word such as uh, C-O-W and read it as co, as in bow, O-W is O, they have to think, does that sound right within the context, which links it also to comprehension, that you're understanding, does that, does that make sense within the context within which you're using it? Note then the pronunciation must be wrong. And in phase six, it's about fluency and being able to tackle words that you've never seen before or never spelt before using those uh, phonic rules that we've learned, those grapheme phoneme correspondences, and making what are termed phonetically plausible attempts at spelling. So we say a word we're unfamiliar with, we have a go using the knowledge that we have. We're now going to come on to high frequency word, and if you look in the main text for uh, letters and sounds on page 193 and thereafter, you will find some lists of high frequency words. These are created from uh, surveys of children's literature to find out which of the words that occur most often when children are reading. And unsurprisingly, number one is the and number two is and. The problem is that uh, a lot of these high frequency words are not... Um, instantly word recognizable because they are not regular. Uh, they, you cannot use your phonics to um, say them aloud or to spell them. However, some are. In order to read fluently, you need to be able to uh, develop automaticity. You shouldn't be sitting sounding out the letters of every, or the graphemes of every word that you read. So developing automaticity means that those high frequency words that are keep coming up, children should just be able to see and recognize. Now, the ones that, as I say, some of them are actually um, regular, which means we can use our phonic rules. So here is a list moving from phase two, phase three, phase four, phase five, phase six. You will notice something if you look at the bottom of phase two here that it says put for northern accents. Well, um, if you, and, and then, sorry, if you then look in phase five, you have put for southern accents. Well, if I say the word mum and but, then if we look at the word put, if the word put was um, phonemically regular, was uh, decodable using your phonics, then it would be put, like golf. But if you are for, have a northern accent, that you may say mum, but, put. So actually they all sound the same. It's only in southern English accents uh, that you find that it actually changes 
the vowel sound changes. So you have to be sensitive to the accent that the children are using as to whether a word is regular or not when you are trying to either spell it or to read it. An important point is what it says here in phase five, that some words which are, were tricky earlier are no longer tricky. Any word that a child struggles to read because they do not have the necessary graphene phoneme correspondences is tricky until they have them. Once you know the rules, then you can read, where you can, you can recognize the words and then comprehend. But if you don't have those graphene phoneme correspondences, it's tricky. So in phase one, you have quite a limited range of graphene phoneme correspondences on which you, can you, which you can draw if a child is going to be able to recognize every word that they read and spell every word that they use. And obviously, as we progress, they become familiar with more and more graphene phoneme correspondences, fewer words become tricky for them. I want to disagree with um, four of the words that they got here because under phonetically, phonemically regular high frequency words that are in letters and sounds, they have got as, is, of, and his. Now, as, is, and his all end in a z sound. If they were phonemically regular, it would be as, is, and his. And of would be off because it's o, f, o, f, and when children are in phase two, then they will have only learnt the f sound for f. So they would be reading off. So I think this is an error. So it's something to watch out for, to, to check. Um, don't just assume that when you've read something is uh, phonemically regular, that it is. Actually think for yourself what happens when you say these words, what happens when you read them. When children have not learnt the rules that they need or that they, the words that use um, graphene phoneme correspondences that are not regular, exceptional words, then children have got to learn just to recognise them and just to be able to write them. So for instance, the word the, which as we've already seen is the highest frequency word. Children will learn the word the in phase two, at the beginning of their phonics learning, they will learn the. There is no point in trying to um, to segment the word the before you spell it, because if you segment it, you get t, h, e. And trying to spell the from the sounds t, h, e is pointless. It doesn't work. You simply have to learn that the is spelled t, h, e. And if we then go down to um, bottom of phase five and look at the word eyes, eyes, you simply have to learn that eyes is spelt E-Y-E-S. You've got E-Y-E -E for the I and the S makes that Z sound again, eyes, not ice. Finally, we come to the uh, issue of morphology, or not issue, but the, the area of morphology, which means learning about suffixes and prefixes, which we call together affixes. So learning about affixes and the root words to which they're attached, and the spelling rules. The spelling rules for prefixes are easy because nothing changes. However, when you add a suffix, there are all kinds of rules about how you add a suffix and what happens to the root word. So children have to learn how to break, how to uh, add suffixes and prefixes to words. They also have to learn how to uh, spell polysyllabic words. So we take, um, we've already talked about bedroom, but if we take plastic, plastic, polysyllabic, it has more than one syllable. We're breaking it down to plas and tick, which is uh, plas is a C, C, V, C syllable, and tick is a C, V, C syllable. Um, and we also need to work on how we uh, spell the sound schwa, which is the uh sound. So farmer, farmer. We know that the uh at the end of farmer is an ER. And 
recognizing the uh, unusual grapheme phony correspondences such as the GH as, the, as an F sound, as in laugh, um, and how to use dictionaries so that children can use their developing knowledge of grapheme phony correspondences and initial sounds to find the words that they want to spell. Finally, they need to develop their spelling strategies beyond the uh, grapheme phony correspondences, so they need to be able to use syllabic, so the, the, the understanding of syllables, their understanding of root words and uh, suffixes and, and prefixes. They also use analogy, so this word sounds like that one, so it may be spelt like that one, um, and taking chunks of words and uh, fitting those in to help spelling, and mnemonics using um, little tricks to remember, like um, one collar and two sleeves for necessary, one C and two S's. In this session, we have looked at the nature of progression in systematic synthetic phonics. We have used letters and sounds as our example scheme in the on the understanding that other schemes may vary slightly from it, and that you will need to make yourself familiar with any scheme that you use in school, whether that is from the 2010 validation, validated list or the 2021 to 22 validated list. Whichever validation the scheme that you are working with is, uh, it comes from, you will see here that progression is clearly highlighted. So in 2010, we see schemes must teach grapheme phoneme correspondences in a clearly defined incremental sequence. And in the new validation, schemes must teach the main grapheme phoneme correspondences of English in a clearly defined incremental sequence. We want children to be able to be comprehending readers, which means they apply their language comprehension to print, to the written text. And it is the process of uh, developing their word recognition, their decoding skills that enables them to do that. And so progression is at the core of everything we do when we are teaching early reading. Now you should complete the online quiz or audit that accompanies this lesson. And if you need any help, then obviously Letters and Sounds is there for you. Go to it and um, find any information that you need to consolidate your own understanding of how children progress in their understanding, their phonic understanding, as early readers.